Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Ruth, chapter 4. This is the last chapter in the book of Ruth, and I keep wanting to say something like, and now, the final exciting conclusion to our story, because that's what it is. This is the last chapter of our sermon series. Uh, You can find those verses, verses 1 through 22, on page 243 in your pew Bibles. And just as we have for the past several weeks, I am going to intersperse the actual reading of the scriptures with the sermon itself. So as we prepare to hear God's word, let us pray. Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Okay, we're going to get to the story of Ruth in just a minute. But first, it was Memorial Day weekend in a small church in a small town somewhere in the world. And on his way to the sanctuary on Sunday morning, the pastor saw a young boy standing in the middle of the hallway staring at a display on the wall. The display was filled with dozens and dozens of pictures, some black and white, faded and tattered, some a lot more recent. And next to each picture was pinned a small American flag. The pastor stopped, said hello to the boy, and the little boy asked him, Pastor, who are all those people in the pictures? In a sad but proud voice, the pastor responded, those are pictures of church members through the years who made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. The boy seemed confused at these words, ultimate sacrifice? And so the pastor tried again. Those are all the young men and women from our church who died in the service. When he heard this, the little boy froze and turned as white as a sheet, and in a trembling, quiet voice, he said, Pastor, did they die in the 9 o'clock or the 11 o'clock service? Humor aside, Memorial Day is one of those holidays that originates in tragedy, the loss of life, loved ones who never came home. And yet we also recognize on Memorial Day the great blessings that come from such great sacrifice. God takes our sorrow and turns it into gratitude for the sacrifice that has been made. And so we respond by promising always to remember that sacrifice. I think the story of Ruth is a lot like this. It begins in tragedy, loss of life, loved ones who never came home. And yet, throughout the course of the story, we begin to see God's providential hand at work, putting lives and families back together again, building and strengthening a nation, and turning sorrow into gratitude as the dead are honored, remembered, and their noble purpose carried forward. You might say that the story of Ruth is the Memorial Day story of the Old Testament. Now, last week in our story, the two widows, Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi, conspired to bring about a match between Ruth and Boaz, an older man, a kind older man, who is related to Naomi's family. And their hope is that Boaz will act as a goel, which is the Hebrew word for a kinsman redeemer. According to ancient Jewish law, the kinsman redeemer is supposed to marry the widow, Ruth, and carry on the family line of her deceased husband. Now, Boaz has agreed to do this, but he's also pointed out that there's a relative even closer with an even stronger claim to be the kinsman redeemer, and that claim must be settled first. That's where we come into our story at verse 1 of chapter 4. No sooner had Boaz gone up to the gate and sat down there 
Then the next of kin, of whom Boaz had spoken, came passing by. So Boaz said, come over, friend, sit down here. And he went over and sat down. Then Boaz took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. And so they sat down. It should be noted that the city gate in ancient Israelite culture, the city gate was the place where judicial transactions took place, kind of like the modern-day courthouses that we see in the center of so many small Texas towns. Boaz has gathered up the elders of the city who act as both witnesses and judges for the case. And then he calls his relative, the one with the stronger claim, he calls him friend and proceeds to bring him forward, maybe into the stand, and Boaz lays out his case. Verse 3, he said to the next of kin, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our kinsman, Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me so that I may know. For there is no one prior to you to redeem it, and I come after you. So he, the other relative, said, I will redeem it. Now, this is a really interesting approach that Boaz is taking. You probably were just as surprised as any other reader to notice that he says nothing at first about Ruth, the real purpose of his suit. Instead, he brings up this parcel of land which belonged to their mutual relative, Naomi's deceased husband, Elimelech. And that's because it is also a Goel's responsibility, a kinsman redeemer's responsibility to keep the land in the family. And so the relative, seeing no disadvantage and every advantage to keeping this land in the family and using it for his own purposes, says, yeah, sure, I'll buy it. Sounds like a great deal. Why does Boaz start with the land? and not with Ruth. It's possible that in a lot of older agrarian cultures, the land would have been seen as far more valuable of those two things. Land produces crops. Land produces more wealth, and with it, more status. A marriage, by contrast, is a cost. Another person to feed, to clothe, to protect. In many ancient cultures, that's why uh, a father-in-law would send with his daughter to be married a dowry, a bride price that would help to support her in the years, of co in years to come. Now, if it's a marriage to a woman who is of higher social status than you, then that's great. There's every advantage to be gained by that sort of marriage or by marriage alliances. But we have to remember that in this case, Ruth is a poor widow and from a questionable country at that. So there's no great advantage here. But the land does seem like a good thing. I also suspect that Boaz is trying to be completely above board and beyond reproach here. You see, if he had mentioned Ruth first and the other relative had rejected her, as is quite likely, then it could later be said that Boaz only married Ruth in order to get that parcel of land. But by putting the land first on the table in view of everyone, acknowledging that fact, the thing that everyone else would have seen as the real value, Boaz is actually quietly laying the groundwork to gain what in his eyes is the far more valuable thing and that is the woman that he and he alone already knows to be faithful, kind, hardworking, and honorable. This is an important lesson, I think, for us. The greatest value does not come from the obvious thing, from material possessions, from things that generate wealth or status. The greatest value is often the hidden value, one that comes from relationships 
and nurturing those relationships, from seeing the dignity and the worth in another human being, and from doing the right thing regardless of the cost. Now that the other relative has publicly agreed to redeem that parcel of land, Boaz makes his move. Verse 5. Then Boaz said, The day you acquire the field from the hand of Naomi, you are also acquiring Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead man, to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance. I love the way Boaz interjects this in. Oh, by the way, that parcel of land, yeah, it comes with a few strings attached. Now, if it were just a parcel of land, you could claim it free and clear and pass it down to your children and their children and their children's children and so on. But since it comes with a person, with a widow, you are obligated to marry that widow and produce children, and then that parcel of land would go to her children. And since they would also be your children, any other parcels of land that you own would also be subject to being divided with the children that you have from Ruth. Oh, and by the way, that widow, she's from Moab, the land of our enemies. I imagine the smile quickly fading from the face of the other relative as he considers perhaps the wife he already has, the children he already has, the land he already has, and the reputation he already has, and how all of these things could be called into question if he acts as kinsman redeemer. Alternatively, it's possible that he may have no wife and no children yet, but in that case, that means that whatever children he might have with Ruth would inherit all of his land along with that parcel, but here's the real kicker, then they would legally carry all of the land and the name of Ruth's deceased husband, not his name. So in essence, he would be giving up his name for the sake of another, his inheritance to carry on another line. So, verse 6, at this, the next of kin said, I cannot redeem it for myself without damaging my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. In other words, hard pass, why don't you take that parcel of land, Boaz, being a kinsman redeemer is costly. Verse 7. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one took off a sandal and gave it to the other. This was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the next of kin said to Boaz, acquire it for yourself, he took off his sandal and presumably walked home with just one. Uh, and it's interesting that the Bible, the Old Testament, which is all of it seems old to us, is taking the time to explain this to the people who are reading it during the time of the Old Testament, meaning that it's an even older custom that would have seemed strange to the people who were reading it, maybe in the 6th or 7th century BCE. And we shouldn't pretend like this is really that strange because somewhere in our culture a long time ago, someone came up with the idea that if we scribble some lines at the bottom of a piece of paper, that that has some meaning and lasting effect for sealing a transaction. We all have interesting quirks in our cultures to transact things like this. So anyhow, that's just an interesting side digression. Then Boaz, this is verse 9, Boaz said to the elders and to all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have acquired from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Malon, his sons. I have also acquired Ruth, the Moabite, the wife of Malon, to be my wife, to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance in order that the name of the dead may not be cut off from his kindred and from the gate of his native place. Today, you are witnesses. Now, if the only thing that Boaz had wanted was the land 
and maybe even Ruth as his wife, he could have easily glossed over that last part about redeeming the name of, the, of her deceased husband. But instead, he singles it out and he makes it clear in front of everyone that he intends to be a good goel, a good kinsman redeemer, a good husband to Ruth, laying aside his own inheritance and risking his name in order to carry on the line of another person. And so the elders of the town recognize that generosity. They see the risk and they understand the noble sacrifice that Boaz is making. And so they respond with a blessing. Verse 11, then all the people who were at the gate, along with the elders, said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. That's a reference to a story in Genesis of the wives of Jacob who produced the, the I'm sorry, the, yes, the wives of Jacob who produced the children who became the, the tribes of Israel. And so may you have numerous children like that to build up the country. May you produce children in Ephrathah and bestow a name in Bethlehem. And through the children that the Lord will give you by this young woman, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. And that last bit, the part about Perez, the son of Tamar and Judah, is a reference to yet another PG-13 rated story in the book of Genesis. This one is far less romantic than the book of Ruth. But both of those stories, the story of Genesis and the book of Ruth together, are probably a good reminder to the readers of the story and to us that we all have questionable characters and unsavory secrets in our family trees, don't we? And yet God, over and over again in the Bible, has a funny way of turning our scandals into successes and our sadness into celebrations. Verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse father of David. Yes, King David, who as a boy slew the giant Goliath. King David, the greatest king in the history of Israel, the man described by the Bible as a man after God's own heart. That David. Now these are the descendants of Perez. Perez was that other ancestor that we just alluded back to. Perez became the father of Hezron, Hezron of Ram, Ram of Aminadab, Aminadab of Nashon, Nashon of Salmon, Salmon of Boaz, Boaz of Obed, Obed of Jesse, and Jesse of David. As you can see by that last concluding lineage, the name and the lineage of Boaz are not in fact forgotten. In the telling and retelling of this story, both his name and the name of Elimelech's sons are preserved and carried on for posterity. And so this looks like the perfect happy ending for Ruth, for Naomi, for Boaz, for the dead. And yet there is just a little bit more. Because 1,000 years after the time of King David, Ruth's great-grandson, in the town, that same town where Ruth and Boaz met and married and started a family, a little town called Bethlehem, another child was born to one of their descendants. His name was Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph. Most of us know pretty well 
the story of Jesus, of his ministry, of his teaching, his death on the cross, his resurrection, and his ascension to heaven. But several hundred years after the story of Jesus began to make its way through the Middle East and then through the entire world, medieval scholars and early students of the Bible began to notice a striking similarity between the story of Jesus and the story of Ruth and Boaz. They compared Ruth to all of the broken and hurting people of the world, people who have experienced loss and rejection, suffering and sorrow, exiles in a foreign land. And they compared Boaz to Jesus, a goel, a kinsman redeemer, who laid down his heavenly inheritance for the sake of his beloved bride, which is his church, his people, rescuing them and redeeming them and reconciling them back into the family of God, preparing for them a place in a new home, a new land, a new kingdom. And that story, the story of Jesus, has been called the greatest story ever told. Just like the story of Ruth, it's a love story, a redemption story, a story of redeeming love. It's your story, and it's my story. Oh, and spoiler alert, also like the book of Ruth, that story has a very, very happy ending. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and God, you lead us sometimes through the valley of the shadow of death. Our story oftentimes begins in mourning and suffering and loss of life and tragedy. Help us to see your guiding hand, carrying us through the midst of that, leading us to your purpose. And we know that in all things you are working for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Sometimes it's hard to see, but help us to tell the stories of those places and those times where we can see it so that we can remind ourselves and remind each other. Lord, help us to be that kinsman redeemer, that source of love and rescue for each other. Help us to be kind and honorable like Ruth and Boaz in this story. Help us to lift up the name of those who came before us, those who sacrificed themselves for us, and help us never to forget their stories. Help us to share their story, and most of all, Lord, help us to share your story with everyone we meet. We pray all these things just as you taught us to pray, saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.